Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 1, verse 26. This is the Essential Bible Studies Podcast. My name is Tim Young. And my name is Frank Abel. Certainly glad to be with you here, Frank and I, to talk to you about a very important subject, as usual, an essential Bible study in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, asking the question, what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? Now, this was a study that we did with our Tuesday night Zoom Bible study class. Uh, For those unfamiliar, we actually get together online and do Bible studies in a very kind of comfortable environment where we can discuss these subjects. And we actually did this study on Tuesday nights, and it was one of those types of studies that we really took a journey through the Bible. Uh, It surprised us in many ways where this topic came up, and so hopefully we can capture a little bit of that magic on the podcast as we talk about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. It's a fairly easy study, concordance study that is. If you got out of Strong's Concordance, you looked up the word image, looked up the word likeness, you'll see it's not used that often. But when you get into it, you'll find that where it is used, there are some very interesting passages that lead us kind of in surprising ways. And there are some passages, too, I think, that come up where you think, does that really relate? And if you sit there and think about it, you find, yeah, it does relate. And that's the wonder of Scripture, isn't it, Frank, when we do our Bible study? So when we come to this verse, Genesis 1 is all about God creating things. He creates the light and darkness. He creates the sea and the the land and the the animals. And it's basically God saying, and things are done, are created. But when we come to this verse 26, there's a change here, and it's a very interesting change. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And there's a grammar change here from kind of a singular aspect to where he actually uses a plural us let us make man in our image. Do you have any thoughts on that, Frank, or why that passage says us there? Well, the Bible is wonderful in the respect of trying to answer that question because there are many things said centuries later that have an effect on how we understand those verses. And mm. Luke chapter 20, verse 36, is a, a case which we would put on the list to help us explain these things. It reads, and I'm reading from the King James, verse 36 of Luke 20, Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So you can see that the object of God in creation, when the angels took up this work, was to be made in the likeness of, of the angels, which we understand to be in the likeness of God, and certainly from the point of view of them being immortal, that this is God's ultimate idea with mankind. I threw that question out there for you, Frank, because we actually had another podcast last season just on angels specifically, and we tackled that question ourselves. I'm glad you agree with us, actually, (laughs) because we came to the conclusion that It's the angels here that are suddenly involved in the creative process of man. I think they've been involved all along, actually. And uh, so we kind of proved that in the podcast. Uh, If you're wondering about that or maybe thought it was something different, I encourage you to go back and listen and find that podcast on angels being made equal unto the angels. And I think that's an important kind of aspect of this passage when you, you think about it, because why does it all of a sudden change to us? And why are the angels all of a sudden involved, you know, kind of like in coordination with God here, saying, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make man? Well, let's make him after our image and after our likeness. Because up to this point, God has been creating beasts of the field, creeping things, fowls, you know, fish. And in the record, if you go back there, it says that they were all created after 
their kind. After their kind, meaning, you know, fish beget fish and cows beget cows. And But when it comes to the creation of man, it doesn't use that term. It, God has a different purpose for a man. And therefore, the angels at this point said, let us make man after our likeness. Now, that wasn't said of the beasts of the field at all. And so it really brings up a special point here about a special creation of man that we are made in the image and likeness of God himself. And that's kind of what we're trying to dig into here, trying to understand what that means. But I think it starts here with recognizing there's a difference between men and animals. But, well, I guess... I guess in some ways there probably aren't any differences between men and animals. In some ways there should be, right? That brings a passage to my mind. It's in Psalm 49, verse 20. It says, Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Maybe that's a good starting point because we can be just like the beasts if we don't have an understanding of God, that's what that passage is saying. It's Psalm 49, verse 20. Man in his pomp or in his own glory, yet without understanding, understanding God, is like the beasts that perish. So, kind of brings up the question to Frank. What, what is this image and likeness of God? I mean, how, is there a difference between these two and how, how are we supposed to understand this? Well, it's also telling us that it's not just a matter of turning up to one passage mm. to find everything we need to know about man and what God had in mind and how God made him. And it illustrates the value of the whole book. So yes, there's an understanding. And we remember, if we can recall the parables of the Lord, that parable of the sower was based upon people either understanding or not understanding God's word. Mm. So a number of people never pick up what God is saying because they never really understand it. But those who understand it can grow. And that's the difference between us and the beasts because we have an understanding. We can read. I don't know of any animals that can read. And <laughs> the idea is that you know, even if we can read, we doesn't necessarily understand it. We got yeah. to continue to read and compare. Yeah, that's true. It's an interesting aspect, especially when we're trying to maybe discriminate somewhat between image and likeness as uh, to what God really meant in that comparison. And I have thought that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we have a bit of an idea here because you may remember this if you've studied the Bible and you're thinking about the value of bodily exercise and where Paul says to Timothy, that's 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8, I'm reading from the King James, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So if people don't understand God's word, they don't really see what God had in mind in creation, it seems like they are somewhat like the beasts in that respect then, because we see animals, so, you know, they're, they're cleaning themselves. The rabbits are washing their face, so to speak, with their paws. And uh, <laughs> we see cats and dogs always grooming themselves. And we see even birds grooming themselves. Well, you see people in oh, yeah. these places where they go for exercise looking at the mirror to see how they're doing looking at themselves. But yeah, that's, yeah. you see, what God considers in this passage in First Timothy chapter 4 is of Something that profits for a little time, because without body exercise, the body doesn't really function very well. But godliness is based on understanding. We would never come naturally with godliness. We have to have that developed. But it has a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So you would think that most people seeing these things would clue on to this, that we really got to get into understanding what God means. And, you know, Genesis 1 that's the first chapter. It's a good idea to have that when we start right away. What does God mean by this idea of creating mankind in his likeness and his image? I've heard say that image and likeness, there's two aspects to it. One is maybe image is like the mental capacity 
and likeness is the bodily form. I've heard that. When I was going through the study, it almost seemed to be, those words almost seemed to be interchangeable, like it didn't matter one or the other. And it seemed to be more of an emphasis, I found, on personality. Like you're saying here, godliness has to do with our character and developing our character and those kind of things, rather than on a bodily form, like you're saying here. Like we can spend all our time training in the gym, but that's not what God has called us for. We're made in the image and likeness of God for a greater type of image and likeness rather than some physical form behind it. That might be true, but I think we'll see that this is really forward-looking to be made in the image and likeness of God. Well, one of the things that the Bible helps us with, too, is even in the idea of the mind of man. As some people are very intellectual, very scholarly, and have gone through all of the institutions of men and still could go on learning and maybe leading learning institutions. But that's not what God really means either, because you see he's talking mm. about a spiritual aspect of our mind, yeah. which doesn't necessarily follow at all by people that are very clever and have a great understanding. What you're saying there is there's an emphasis more on the spiritual qualities that are coming. And I think I ran across this when I was just looking at this word, just going through systematically. I came to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's one of those passages where I kind of say, well, does this really apply to the study I'm doing here on the image of likeness of God? Because if you come to Deuteronomy chapter 4, it's all God talking about how he manifested himself to Israel in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. And it says there in Deuteronomy 4 verse 12, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And then as he's commanding the children of Israel, by emphasizing that they didn't see anything, there was no image, there was no likeness that was manifest at that time, in verses 15 and 19, he says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. It's basically a command not to make idols, right, and to worship things that God has actually created. I think it's the interesting in the emphasis here in Genesis, we were created in the image of likeness of God, but when God comes to it, he says, you're not to make any likeness of male or female. Now, that's, that's an echo, I think, back to Genesis. And it's also telling because God says, you saw no form in that day. So it's not the image that we're worshiping here. It's not the image that's the important thing behind this. It's what you don't see that is revealed through the voice or the word of God, which is the important thing. That's uh, really quite an intriguing thought because we'll also recall that when the children of Israel went into the wilderness after, and while they were receiving the commandments of God, which essentially says this, that they should not be making any images, they couldn't figure out what happened to Moses. Like he was taking a long time to come back down from that mount. Oh, yeah. And before long, they said, well, let us make something we can see. So, you yeah. know, they come up with calves. They, they did exactly what the God said not to do right. immediately. So there is a tendency in mankind to do these things, to have something that they can see. Right. Yeah. And God purposely does not allow us to do that. He says, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to think and to reason what I really have in mind here. And that's the beauty of this subject. It's also uh, found in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 23, where you see that God is taking issue with people here when he talks about the same idea of people having to have something in front of them that they can see, even if they call it by God's name, even if they give it attributes, that's not what God wants when he is talking about his image. So we see in verse 23 of Romans 1, reading from the King James, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made 
like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed things and creeping things. So that's the object of what? 4,000 years of history mm. of mankind is what they have done and continue to do today. People still want something that they can see. And Tim, you know what? It's interesting. I had a trip to the Vatican. I've had more than one trip there. But when I first went there, I think the greatest impression that was made upon me was going in to the Vatican and to the courtyard there and seeing the big obelisk that was right in the center of the arms of, of that are made there, sort of welcoming people. Yeah, coming I think in. I've seen like aerial pictures. You see that right in the middle of the square. I there, couldn't figure it out. Is it why would anyone want to make something like that, which is a symbol? It's an icon. It represents something, right okay. in the center of something where you no know, God wants us to worship Him correctly. And more impressively, as I got closer to the building, I noticed that there were two statues out there. One representing the Apostle Peter. One representing the Apostle Paul. So I just stopped and, and looked at it. I was trying to, in my mind, sort out why would people do this? Well, Peter had a scrolls under one arm and he had keys, which for anyone who knew their Bible would link him to Peter, but it was the expression on the face, so cleverly sculpted there, that made the greatest impression upon me because it looked like it was a, it was a feeling of conquest, like I've done this, follow me. Well, even the Apostle Paul said, follow me, but as I also follow Christ. So in doing these things, we have to be very careful of the power. It's almost like a hypnotic power that images have over us. Mm. And that is not helpful when it comes to what God had in mind for worshiping him or following him or looking forward to being in his image. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, the command not to make images, because they saw no form in that day yet. Like, even in the Vatican, you're saying there's images of man, but that seems to be a real thing. All societies, they have these statues they put up to honor certain figures throughout history. And now we're finding that people are really upset by these figures, and they're pulling them down, right? right. So yeah. they're all representations of mortal men. And that's what, when you read this passage, and when you brought this passage up in Romans, I think maybe this is the, the key of it, because he says, they made images resembling corruptible man, right? The King James says corruptible. The ESV says after mortal man, but I like that King James version because it says corruptible man, not after the incorruptible God. You can't make an image after the incorruptible God because the things that are incorruptible are intangible, right? Their faith, their hope, their love, they are all those things that are eternal. God's word is eternal. But these things that the images that man sets up are after mortal man or corruptible man, corruptible things. And that's God says, don't you, I don't want you to follow corruptible things. I want you to follow things that are not seen. <laughs> that just actually reinforces the idea that in the beginning, it was the angels that said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, the angels are immortal. Yeah. I suppose that you would have to think about this. Maybe that thought wouldn't occur to you immediately in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. But it, as you go through the scriptures, it does, that God's immortal, and he's calling us to a higher calling. Now, when we go back to that Genesis passage, I think you can almost misread it thinking like, let us make man in our image after our likeness as being something that was immediately done. Like, as soon as this physical form of man was there, he was in the image and likeness of God. But as I read through some scripture— having the likeness of God was a, a future aspect, a future promise. And it made me kind of rethink that passage in Genesis. That maybe it, it's talking about a process, something that's going to take some time, that the angels are saying, we're going to make man in our image and likeness, but he has to go through some trials first and some fires before he gets there. Now, this is a neat one in Psalm 17, verse 15. I just start off this example. Let me uh, turn there. In Psalm 17, verse 15, the psalmist says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness when I awake. I shall be satisfied with your likeness. And there's that word likeness there yes, again, right? Yes. But it's a very curious verse because he talks about awaking as if he's awaking out of sleep. But it, 
We've talked about this in a podcast called We Shall Not All Sleep. And we talk about death as sleep. That's the way the Bible talks about it. So if you're interested in that, you can go back and listen to that. But that's what this passage is talking about here. It's not talking about just waking up in the morning out of sleep. It's talking about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. When Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And that's what the psalmist's hope was for. And it's just interesting in that language about awaking out of the sleep of death. He says, I shall be satisfied with your likeness, as if he's looking forward to being in the image and likeness of God to the fullest extent, because when the resurrection happens, that's when we receive immortality, and that's when we'll be made equal to the angels. Yeah, that's a thought that doesn't occur to a lot of people. In fact, some people are even doubt that the resurrection is mentioned in the Old Testament. So oh, yeah, no. It's, it's kind of important yeah. to see that. Yeah. Uh, the in word's verses. not there, but the concepts are all yes. over the place. Yes. Yeah. Well, First John chapter 3, verse 2 is another one. Oh, okay. In King James Version, it reads as follows, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, again, you see, it's not doesn't really mention the word resurrection, but we're no. waiting for the Lord to return. We know that he has been resurrected. We know he has been made immortal. And the hope that we have is that when we see him, we shall be like him. We'll see him as he is. So, for sure, this idea of awakening and this idea of the Bible speaking prophetically about being in the image and similitude of God we certainly see that here, and that's sort of a reverberating theme that we find in many parts of the New Testament about seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in the future and noting that some remarkable differences from what people may have seen him in the first century. Yeah. You know, we have a hymn in our hymn book. It says, we shall be like him. We sing that, right? And it's just, it's one of my favorite hymns. Yeah, that I is love a, that hymn. It's a lovely hymn, yeah. When he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be in the image and likeness of God to the truest extent. And this is where kind of the body aspect, I think, comes in, because in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. So we're not no longer going to be in these corruptible bodies, these bodies that are corrupting because of sin. We'll be made immortal. And so both then in, in character, personality, and in bodily form, we're going to be like him. There's a, another passage I was thinking of as you were talking about that. It's in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. Let me start in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be made like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So there's that word like again, or likeness, and we're, we're going to be transformed. Our bodies are going to be transformed from these lowly, humble bodies to like his glorious body. So we can, all the different kind of thoughts, <laughs> take us to different passages about the glory of, of Jesus. Right? Well, Tim, I'm facing the latter end of mortality, for sure, when you get up into the upper ages. Yeah. Unlike, you know, when the strength of your life, when you really can't see that you could gain much by being immortal because you feel so good right now, that's very different when you get older and you mm -hmm. start to see the value of what God has been saying. To right. be made into his likeness is a wonderful thing. To be given the, the vision in the scriptures of the immortal Jesus coming back to reign on earth, the vision of the angels who cannot die, now that's a wonderful hope we have. Yeah. So there's three passages, Psalm 17, verse 15, 1 John 3, verse 2, Philippians 3, verse 21. That's not all the passages, but they talk about a future hope to be made like Jesus, to be made like unto the angels, to be made like unto God. And that has to come into our thinking when we go back to Genesis 1, verse 26, and just what was really the purpose of God saying, let us make man in our image and likeness. And how it just wasn't on that day. It was going to be a process throughout time. 
And of course, it all centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there's no other way that we're going to be made in the image and likeness of God. If we're going to be made in the image and the likeness of, of Jesus, it's the same thing. It's the same aspect. It's taking on his qualities, his characteristics that get us to that point. So, Frank, we've ran out of time for this episode, but there's still so much more to go. I think we'll go to part two. Be able to stick around? <laughs> yeah, I'd be glad to stick around. Lee. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up here on, on those thoughts. But on the next episode, we're going to bring in the Lord Jesus Christ because there's a couple passages that talk about him being in the image of God that relate back to Genesis 1 verse 26 and our association of how we have to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ to be made in the image and likeness of God. Sound good, Frank? That sounds great. All right. If you like the podcast, please just take a little bit of time and rate us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you see stars. I love seeing stars, especially five stars. Little things like this can be a big boost for spreading these essential Bible studies. We'd like to meet you. Every Tuesday night, we meet online for a Zoom Bible study. Come by and just say hi. It's an informal group discussion format where everybody is encouraged to ask questions and share their perspectives on the scriptures. I think you'll really like it. It happens every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To get the Zoom meeting link, go to our website at www.essentialbiblestudies.org and fill out the form. Speaking of questions, if you ever have a question about the podcast or the subject matter, then drop it on us at our website contact form. Again, that's www.essentialbiblestudies.org. The Essential Bible Studies podcast is sponsored by the Book Road Christadelphian Ecclesia, located somewhere in the frozen tundra of Ancaster, Ontario, Canada. Put on a coat, it's cold outside. Okay, Frank, why don't you end the show for us? May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.